message the Lord's laid on our heart this morning. If you have your Bibles and will, turn with me to the 100th Psalm. 100th Psalm. I hope and pray that everybody had a glorious, wonderful Thanksgiving, however you chose to uh, celebrate. I, <clears throat> I hope that uh, we all took the time to stop and to truly be thankful for the blessings that we have received. Now, <clears throat> we are entering into a time of two holidays that, that go back to back that are of great celebration for us with Thanksgiving and Christmas. It is a time to be thankful and a time to praise. And as we begin into this season of thankfulness and praise, I hope that we can all take the moment. I, I truly believe biblically we are expected to take a moment to pause, to remember, to reflect, and especially respect the abundant blessings that God has given to each and every one of us. Because there are too many for us to count if we truly want to stop and count the blessings that we have. Now, remember, this is a season that we have, and I'm including this entire month from Thanksgiving up to Christmas. This is a, this is a time of thankfulness and praise. Okay, don't forget that those need to go together. It, just because our celebration, our day of thanksgiving is over doesn't mean that our attitude and our disposition of thanks should be over. We should continually have a thankful heart. That should be the attitude and the disposition of every true believer that there is, we should always have thankfulness and praise in our hearts. But this is a season where it's particularly brought out, and we need to remember that. Now, unfortunately, there are going to be millions of people throughout the world who are going to choose to use this time as a time of intolerance, indulgence, and probably a time of just complete ingratitude. They're not going to be thankful for anything. We don't like the idea of tolerating a whole lot of others, okay? And <clears throat> which is fine and, and good because it's just like most celebrations. As you all know, I'm not a people person. So the whole idea of large crowds gathering together, when that can't happen, that really doesn't bother me. Right, because it, it's, not a, it's not important to me to have these large groups of people come together. And if you have to spend three, four hours with some of your family that you haven't seen in a while and then you get to see them again, it's not always glorious. Right, so we have this type of intolerance for these people. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You're looking at me like I'm crazy, but you know there's part of your family you just don't like. These uncles, cousins, aunts, uncles, somebody in your family that you just don't care if you see them or not. Right? <clears throat> don't mean you don't love them, you just don't want to see them. Right? <clears throat> but what we see is that in this whole idea, we, we tend to have more of that intolerant attitude. We tend not to be as thankful because we get so wrapped up on indulging ourselves in certain things. For instance, for Christmas. Now, a lot of people this year, especially, this year Christmas is not going to be the same for any of us, okay? The celebration that we have in Christmas, even here at church, we're talking about doing something which we will inform everybody more of, hopefully within the next week or so, because uh, we've still got to get some things worked out and talk about and that kind of stuff. But, <clears throat> but our Christmas this year as a church is not going to be the same. Our Christmas program is not going to be the same. Things that we're going to do between now and Christmas are not going to be the same. Okay, and that's just things that we've got to deal with at this particular point in time that we're in. Okay, things are not the same. And I don't expect for us to go through treating things that they are the same. But what we have to do is we have to realize that at this particular time, <coughs> God expects an attitude from us that characterizes who we truly are as believers. 
no matter when that is. It's not just for a day or for a month. Okay, it's not just during this season, it's something that he ex expects all the time. Now, a lot of people are going to go through this time and we get so wrapped up in the idea of the shopping for Christmas and everybody's trying to find the deals. And, you know, thank goodness that most people weren't out at the stores beating each other to death and spraying pepper spray. Did you ever see that when that woman sprayed pepper spray on that crowd at the Walmart to get somewhere? Now, everybody it was all trying to hunt that woman down and all that, and I thought, that lady's smart. Son, she's smarter than most because she dispersed that crowd quickly. All you got to do is put a little pepper spray out there, they go, and you get your little toy walk out the door. All right. <clears throat> now, if you're the one that got sprayed, it ain't so funny, but other than that, it's pretty funny. But anyhow, I know that's cruel, but it's true. But <clears throat> y'all ain't got no sense of humor this morning, do you? All right. <laughs> but anyway, I still think that's funny. But what we see is that most people are going to get caught up in the hustle and bustle of this and we forget to reflect on who we are. We really forget to be res respectful to the Lord for being our creator, for giving us a, a, giving us a conscience, which is the Holy Spirit, which is our God, okay, and for giving us the understanding of where our true citizenship is. Now these are all things that should make us extremely thankful and when we are thankful want to make us praise the Lord. Now we are about to celebrate the birth of our Savior, which is a glorious thing, okay? We are about to celebrate Jesus Christ coming into the world so that he could be the perfect sacrifice. It's not his virgin birth that, that is, you know, something that is spectacular, which it is, and it's a miracle in itself, and I'm not ever belittling that. But it's not just about his birth, it's not about his perfect life, but it's about what he did on the cross that made the difference for us. But without the virgin birth, without the perfect life, there is nothing, nothing that is held up in his death, paying the penalty, dying and raising again, without all of that working together, none of it will exist. So we celebrate this. And we celebrate our glorious Savior and what He was. Right, to do that, you must praise Him. You must live a life of praise. You must live a life of thankfulness. Now this is what God expects from us. Remember that He is our Creator. Let's read Psalm 100 that explains it as well as anything. And this is all a psalm that every one of us know. It's very, it's very simple. And it's very easy for us to understand. But how, how many times do we truly slow down and really look at what God says to us in these five verses? Let's look at them together. <clears throat> Verse number one. He says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands, all people. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know you that the Lord, He is God. It is Him that has made us, and not we ourselves, but we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him, and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Now this is a psalm that is about coming into the presence of God. This is a psalm that is about presenting yourself before God as His child. Praising Him, honoring Him for all that He's done. Now, I say all this and I come to this psalm because the Lord laid this message on my heart this week from a comment that I heard earlier in the week. Um, and it was made by some people that, that I respect and by some people that, that I know 
uh, I truly believe in my heart that they're, they're Christians, they're true believers, they're saved by God's grace. But they made a comment that, that broke my heart. And, and it, it upset me to the point that I went home and started to think about all the things that I truly am thankful for. Okay? Because the comment that was made was one was talking to the other and they were saying, I don't have very much. They were talking about Thanksgiving coming up and they were saying, I don't have very much to be thankful for. And then the other comment to the other person was, well, in this, in this time, in this year, we have absolutely nothing to be thankful for. Now, this, these are comments from people that, that I believe are saved by God's grace. These words came out of the mouth of believers. We don't have very much to be thankful for, and there's absolutely nothing that we have this year to be thankful for. And, and my heart just cringed and broke when I heard that because I thought that's, not, that's nowhere near the truth. That is not at all true. And as believers, that should wake us up and make us realize what we truly have. So I went home and I sat down and I made a list and on, I don't even know how many pages it was, I don't even remember. But four or five different pages, I just listed the things that I had in my life to be thankful for. Things that I knew that God had given me in my life that I had to be thankful for. Simple things like we all know, our family, our friends, our church family. Uh, I was for, for my children, for my grandchildren. And, and all these things that we can all think of. But then I started to list within myself and, and on this piece of paper, I started to list the things that I was truly thankful for that I know were God-given gifts right? these are things that every one of us true believers possess in our life and so as I started to go through these and I started to break down and I, and I said Lord just show me what you want me to use on Sunday and so I went down and I noticed that in this line of words that I didn't do purposely because I'm not that smart <clears throat> but there were a list of words that all started with the letter G almost back to back. And so I picked out seven of those with the Lord's help and that's what I want to talk about this morning. These seven things that start with the letter G in this glorious season that we celebrate, things that we should be thankful for and that we should always praise God for. And the first two was because... <clears throat> I heard my little granddaughter, Emma, who at the beginning of every night, now, now the boys always say their prayers too, don't misunderstand me. But when we, we sit down to eat supper, and, and we usually try to eat supper and get to eat supper together as a family with my son and my grandchildren and, and Jordan and dad, and uh, we all try to gather together as much as we can. It doesn't always happen, but, but anyway. I get to hear Emma start every night because she's usually the first one that says her blessing right, over the food. <coughs> so Emma says her prayer and she starts. And I started to think this is a prayer that, that probably all of us have learned when we were children over the years. But she starts out with God is great, God is good. We all know the little one. Let, him thank, let us thank him for our food. Okay? By his hand we all are fed. We all know the little prayer. All right? <coughs> Emma prays that every night before she eats and so when she started and she started to say her little blessing before she ate it just it hit me tremendously God is great God is good and and so those are the first two things that I want you to notice the greatness of God things that are worth praising him for now think about what it is to be great Okay. The way we define greatness in our world and in society is the way that we measure a person's success in life. Uh, now, the way we measure success, unfortunately, in life is through material things and how much that you gain and how much you get or how much you accomplish in the field or in the job that you have. That's the way we determine success. And there's nothing wrong with that success. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying don't strive to be successful because that's foolishness. Strive to be successful. 
But our job as believers is to be successful in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of man. Right? How does God see you and how does God view you, even though the world may view you as successful or not? Does God see you as successful or not? And, and when you look at that, then that determines how great you are in the eyes of God, but how great God truly is in our, in our world, in the, in the society that we live in, the way that people see God. We talk about the power of God, but we don't always depend upon the power of God. We talk about the greatness of God and how God can do all things, but yet we don't trust Him as if He can do all things. All right? A true Christian who believes that God is great is a Christian of faith. And faith, and, and I don't know how to easier describe this, than faith removes doubt. Right, there's, I don't know any other way to put it. When you live in a life where you doubt or where you worry or where you fear, your faith is affected. And when your faith is affected, then your relationship with God is affected and you don't look at God as if He is so great anymore. You don't depend upon the power of the Almighty. You start to depend upon your own power and your own greatness. Not on the greatness of God. How great is God? Now we can go back through the Old Testament, which I'm not going to do, and we can pick out all these things that God did with Israel that God is not going to do with you and I. Okay, And I'm just going to be blunt and tell you the truth. God is not going to part the Red Sea for you. God is not going <laughs> to deliver you from the hand of a giant. Right? God is not going to make the walls of some city fall down as a trumpet blows. And you're saying, you're telling us that God can't perform miracles? No, that's not at all what I'm saying. That's foolishness. God performs miracles every day. But I'm telling you, if you're sitting around waiting, waiting for God to part the sea so that you can walk through on dry land... You're not going to find it in the age of grace. It doesn't work that way. All right? Their blessings were earthly. Ours are heavenly. The way, God, the way God blesses you is by your faithfulness to Him and His greatness comes through providing you a way. Providing you help. Helping you to overcome. You see, God told us that there was going to be tribulation in the world. That disease was going to come. That pestilence was going to come. There are going to be pandemics. There are going to be deaths. There are going to be horrible diseases worse than this that come along. I promise you. Not because I think so or because some scientists thought so, but because God said so. But God said as His children, He will help us to overcome. He didn't say, I will keep you from it. He said, I will help you overcome it. He didn't say that He would separate us from the problems of the world. He said that He would guide us through the problems of the world. God is great. Do you believe that God is great? All right. So if, if we truly believe that God is great and that God can overcome these things, why do we spend our time living as if the only hope we have is within ourselves? That the only thing that we have to depend upon is other men or women who can help us overcome these situations. Right? And I'm not saying that we, we were having a conversation before church ever started. Okay, God expects us to use common sense. God gave you common sense. Now, whether you use it or not, it's up to you, but God gave it to you. Okay, and so we are to be safe. We are to be respectful of others. We are to be. I'm not saying go out and live and run up to somebody that you know has got COVID and kiss them right in the mouth hoping you can get it. That ain't what I'm talking about. Right? What I'm talking about is that we are to be respectful, but we depend upon something that is greater. <laughs> Here's another situation we face in the world. We're looking for government to solve our problems. 
And we're looking in the wrong place because government, the government that we have in the United States is not great. God is great. All right? God is great. Our governmental system, and I'm not talking about the, the, the president now or the president to come. I'm not talking about any of that, okay? So don't misunderstand me. This is not, a, this is not about the whole political aspect of things. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about our governmental system cannot fix the problems that you and I are going to face on a daily basis. They don't have the know-how. They don't have the means. They don't have the things that they can do to fix the problems of the world. But God does. We believe that, right? right? Now, when we believe that, then that means that we have to put our faith and trust in the one that is greater than we are. Remember what John wrote. John wrote a simple little verse in a statement that he was making about the love of God. Now that's what John was talking about in 1 John 4 when he writes this statement when he said, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Psalm 147 verse number 5 says, The Lord is great. His understanding is infinite. Infinite. Now that's a big word. That word is forever. There is no end to infinite, right? God understands what we are facing in our life. God is great. And shouldn't we be thankful for the greatness of God? <clears throat> we look at all the people who are struggling through tribulations. You know how many people are not going to get to have the Christmas? As I was saying, Christmas is not going to be the same this year because they lost their job because of pandemic or for other reasons or because of something that comes or Kenny was just talking about earlier how that things had been affected in their life because of this same pandemic they were dealing with. I'm not blaming the problems on the pandemic. That's not what I'm saying that it all doesn't exist there. But this was a lot of cost. Do you know how many people are not going to have the same kind of Christmas this year? And yet <clears throat> When we look at this and we see the struggles that people are going through, we say, well, I know God is great. I know that God is greater than all this. I know that God is good. All right? Simply the act of being good, doing good things. God is great. God is good. But we don't depend on Him like we should. We try to solve all the problems ourselves by trying to overcome it. It's not the same. And if now, if there is no other time like right now than to depend upon God's help in all of our situations. You know, all the pastors that I have talked to in the past three months and I have talked to multiple pastors at different times over the past three to four months, I'll say. And you know that, that each one of the churches that pastors go to, some big, some smaller, but each one of these, when, when I talk to them about, the, we talk about church, we talk about the struggles that the church itself, God's entire family is going through, and how that... At the beginning of the pandemic, I was excited because I felt like people were going to exist in a time that when we were separated from each other for a while, we were going to come back with this zeal, with this fire, that when we came back to worship God, that we were going to come back on fire and that we were going to change the world with the strength of the Christians. And you know what, as I've talked to other pastors, you know what I have seen and what they have seen? A people who are dying. A people who are going away, a people that didn't come back with zeal and didn't come back with fire. They didn't come back ready to change the world. We came back groping and complaining and moaning and whining. We came back worse than we were before we left because instead of building our spirituality with God, we have let it fail because we quit, we quit depending on the greatness of God and the glory of God and we started to depend upon ourselves. And we started to separate ourselves and we quit having fellowship and we quit doing things that caused us to grow in God. 
And instead of coming back with zeal, we came back dead. Spiritually. And instead of finding hope, we found a hopeless situation. Because you and I can't control it. Our government can't control it. The United Nations can't control it. The CDC can't control it. And instead of depending on the one that is in control and depending on his greatness and his goodness, we have turned and we have gone another way. And you say, preacher, we don't need to hear that. I'm, t I'm sorry. I'm just telling you the truth. If you want to get mad at me, be mad at me. I don't care. You won't be the first. You're not going to be the last. Stay mad at me. I don't care. I don't apologize for the word of God and for what I know to be true. I have seen the failures of the church itself. I'm talking about the body of Christ, okay? I'm not talking about you as an individual. Maybe you came back on fire. I hope so. Keep it. Don't lose it. But if you didn't come back and you're not on fire for God, then that's affecting your relationship with God. And you have to depend on the greatness of God and the goodness of God. You have to grow. I don't, we, we've forgotten to be thankful and praise Him for all that He's done. We say God is great. We say God is good. But how much do we trust Him? Prove that He's great and follow Him. Prove that you put your faith in Him and follow Him. Prove that you know that He performs miracles on a daily basis. Follow Him because He is the overcomer. He is the great physician. He is the advocator. He is our hope in a hopeless world. He is our all in all. We can go on and on and on and on about the things that Jesus Christ is to us. Above all, He is your Savior and that's enough. That's more than enough. Because of the third thing that we see that we have, thank, we have to be thankful for, His grace. His grace. Have you ever stopped and truly thought about the grace of God? Oh, we all know that it means undeserved kindness, undeserved merit, undeserved favor. You hear me talk about grace all the time because you and I live in the age of grace. We must understand that. We live in a time where you are not expected to abide by the law, but you live under grace, not because of what you can do. As Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, nothing you have done, but it said it, grace, is the gift of God. God gave it to you not because you deserved it or because you earned it. It had absolutely nothing with what you did. Chris has been teaching in Job, and, and I, I just have to say for the past four weeks, Chris's Sunday school lessons, before he got out of Proverbs, I mean, we have just, it has just really taken over. And I'm not saying that it's because Chris changed something or something happened or we had some great shocking moment. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying over the past four weeks, I have just been tremendously, tremendously blessed with the Sunday school lesson. I go home filled with that and I think about it all week long. And when Chris came last week and he said, I'm going to start in Job, I was a little shocked. But I thought, man, that's good stuff. I know God led you there because most people ain't going to the book of Job. Right? Not because it ain't good, not because it's not great, but because it's not easy. You know why? Because it's a slap in all of our faces. Because it's just like Chris said, how would we react? We would ask why. When we lost our family, when we lost our homes, when we lost everything, what's our first reaction? Why, God, why? You know how many people are going around today asking, why, God, why? Why are we suffering? Why are we dealing with all this negative stuff? Why, God, why? But Job didn't. Job never once asked why. He never once turned against God. He never did anything. That was negative. <clears throat> Do you know how he stayed so strong? Oh, you say, well, he, he was patient because that's what we always talk about. How do you get patience? The only way the Bible tells us that you can ever get patience is through tribulation. Right? Now, that's what the Bible says. That's not what I said. That's what God said. God said the only way you're ever going to learn patience is to have problems. 
Because you learn how to have patience through problems and that problem teaches you to have faith. It gives you experience in life and it gives you hope and hope develops faith. You see, it makes you believe. It makes you remove all doubt. Where does all that come from? God's grace. God's grace has always been and always will be. But you and I are saved by it because he wanted us to realize that it's not of yourselves, it's not of your works, it's not because of anything you accomplished. It's not because you are good or because you are great, but it is because God is great and because God is good, we have grace. Because God is righteous, we have grace. Because God is the one true judge that knows you better than anything. He said, as we talked about last week, you don't get what you deserve. You get grace. Think think about that. You don't get what you deserve. Instead, God says, I'm going to give you grace. You're going to have hope. You're going to have peace. You're going to have all these things because I love you. Not because you deserve it, but because I love you. You know what God's grace led to? The fourth thing, I got to hurry. You know what God's grace led to? (coughs) God's grace led to the gospel. The gospel. And everybody says, oh, let's define the gospel in this aspect, in this aspect, and let's talk about it this way and that way. No. No. The gospel is explicitly defined in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 when he said this is the gospel. You can't put it any plainer than that. This is the gospel. This is the gospel we live by. What is the gospel? That Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures. He died for your sins. He died to pay your penalty. Not because of what you did, but because of his grace, he suffered. So you didn't have to. He was buried, which meant he was dead because you can't raise from the dead if you're not dead. He rose from the dead and he became our salvation through that resurrection. That is the gospel that we are to believe. That is the good news of Christ. That is it. Paul wrote in Romans 1, 16, For I am not... I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And then he explains why. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? He said, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Who to? To everyone that believes. To everyone that believes. That's the gospel. Do you know what we have to be thankful for? That is your salvation. God's grace, God's gospel go together, hand in hand. It is because of His grace that we have the gospel. It is because of the grace and the gospel that we have the next thing, which is His guidance. His guidance in our life. Think about what a God does. It's pretty simple. A guide will lead you from one destination to another. Not only will he lead you from one destination to another, but he leads you to something that he leads you safely from one destination to another. A guide will also, it's like a hunting guide. Right? If you're going to hire a hunting guide and you're going to go hunt deer, then you want him to take you where you're going to see deer. You don't want him to take you into somebody's cow pasture. That doesn't help you. You want him to take you where you can see deer. Jesus Christ is our God. He has come to guide us through life. He has left us the Holy Spirit, which he described himself as your comforter and your guide. It is to guide you with your conscience that we talked earlier about. To help you. Sean Tay was making a comment earlier about something in, in the Sunday school lesson about the devil on one shoulder, the angel on the other, like the little cartoon. And that's exactly the flesh between the ward and the spirit. That's exactly what it looks like. Right? <clears throat> Satan saying, no, don't. And God saying, yes, you can. Satan saying, you have no hope in the world. 
You're going to die, live in fear, be afraid of all these things. No, you can't overcome these problems. No, you're not ever going to find another job. No, this job is the best you can find. No, no, no. But Jesus Christ is telling us, you can do all things through me. That's what Christ told us. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Not because I am strong, but because he is strong. Not because I am great, but because he is great. And I will follow this trail because he is leading me down it. Where is Christ taking you? What does Christ have in store for you? What does Christ have in store for Calvary Baptist Church? What does he expect from us? Does he expect us because we're not a great big church to dry up and blow away and shut down because of all these problems? Or does he expect us to be a lighthouse in this community right now when they need a lighthouse more than any other? We need lighthouses more now than we have ever needed them before because the world is dark. The world out there is dark and God needs His children to light the path. God needs His children to be those lights that He said that you are a light that He set up on a hill. He needs you to guide people in. He needs you to help them. I'm not just talking about bring them into the church. I'm talking about guide them to grace and the gospel and He'll take care of the rest with the salvation. He is our guidance and that's something we should be thankful for. You know what else we should be thankful for? His government. We don't think about it. We don't talk about it a whole lot. But we should be thankful for His government. You know what a governing (coughs) uh, party is supposed to do? They are supposed to dictate sovereign rule and authority. That's the first part. And they are supposed to develop laws and policies that best affect the people. Now, that's all government sanctions, not just ours. We live in a democracy where some of those things with sovereign authority and rule does not always apply to our government because the sovereign rule and authority in a democracy rests upon the people, not upon the government. All right? But that's not the way most governments are set up. That's not the way God's government is set up. There's one sovereign ruler. There's one sovereign authority. And that's Jesus Christ. That's the sovereign authority that we have to follow. Now, a verse that gets used all the time at Christmas time is Isaiah 9, 6. For unto you this day a child is born, a child is given. For unto us a child is born, a child is given. And upon his shoulders, what does it say is going to be? A government. A government to which there will be no end. He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty Prince. Okay? We all know the verse. But what is it? It's his government. It's him setting up his reign and his rule to have true authority over us to guide us and direct us, to help us. Jesus Christ. Don't we all strive to get to heaven? Is that not our end goal, is to get to heaven? It's mine. Now we think about it, but it's an afterthought for most people. Instead of focusing on it, when Jesus Christ said, Watch, be ready. Be ready for me to set up and to rule and to reign. In a world where there's no more night. Why? Because night is done away with. Because Jesus Christ is a light and that light never goes out. So night is gone. You're going to live in a glorified body that you don't need rest anymore. You don't need any of those things anymore. Why? Because sin and death have been removed. And when sin and death are removed, then so is pain and sorrow and anguish and trouble There is no more distress in heaven. Now, we don't stop and think about the glories of what God's government is going to bring. We are still looking for hope. There are people who are looking for hope in the government. Some are depending upon the president we have now. Some are depending upon the next president that's about to come. And I'm saying we look at this, and it doesn't matter who you support or who you don't support. I'm saying (laughs) we all know what we think, okay? 
But what I'm saying is it doesn't matter in our government. They're not going to solve the problems. But in Jesus Christ's government, there are no problems. There is no political corruption. There is no fraud. There is no wandering. Because he has already promised us and removed all of these things. Be thankful. Last thing, I'll shut up. Is the thing that we truly have to be thankful for is God's gifts. God's gifts. You know what a gift is? <clears throat> Everybody says, and at Christmas time, don't you want to, don't you hate it when somebody gives you a better gift than you gave them? You know, it's like most people who will give, you know, if you give a, a posted note to somebody with some little sentiment wrote on it or something, and you think, you know, that's really good. But then they hand you the keys to a brand new Cadillac. It's like, hmm, that posted note wasn't so good. Was it? We try to outgive one another. <clears throat> but you know, that's not a gift at all. That's not a gift. A true gift is something that you exchange with one another or that you hand to another human being or another person or whatever you want to put it. When you hand it to them without expecting any compensation whatsoever. None. You don't expect anything in return when you give a gift. Now remember, what was grace? What did it say that it was? It said it was the gift of God because grace brings salvation. Right? There is no salvation without grace. There first has to be grace. Without a merciful God, there's, <clears throat> there's no hope for mercy. So we get what we deserve. But because of a merciful, loving God, we receive grace. Because of grace, we have the gospel, which leads to salvation. Because of grace, we have salvation. And what did it say it was? The gift. God doesn't expect anything in return from you. He expects you to take his gifts and be thankful for them and to praise him for those gifts. What are his gifts? His greatness, his goodness, his grace, his gospel, his guidance, his government. We could go on and on and on. We all know about the gifts of God. These are just seven that we talked about today. But I want you to think about the gifts of God in your life and how you are going to go through this next month. This is not about a day as we set aside on Thanksgiving. It's not about a day that we set, set aside on Christmas. <clears throat> This is not about a day of any of those. It's not about a month, this season that we're going through. This is about an attitude and a lifestyle. This is about how God expects His believing children to be disciplined and to be devoted believers in Christ. That's what He expects. And to do that, you have to have a thankful heart and you have to have a spirit that praises the Holy Spirit. You have to have a spirit that praises God above all because you understand that there's no hope in the world without Him. There's no salvation without Him. There's no Christmas without Him. There's no tomorrow without Him. But with Him, we have all those things. With Him, we do have something that is greater than the world has. But yet we mope around and we make comments that I don't have anything to be thankful for this year. Now you see why I said earlier that when the church came back, it came back dying, not on fire. If we as believers have that attitude, if we as believers have that kind of thought process, how are we ever going to show the world that there's hope in anything else? How are we ever going to show them the love of Christ if we don't portray the love of Christ? How can we ever show them that Jesus Christ loves them if we don't love one another? You see, <clears throat> everything that Jesus Christ exudes comes to us biblically through His Word. He shows us everything we need to be in His book. He shows us everything we need to be in His life through His death 
through his resurrection. And he said, all I need you to do is be thankful and praise me. Not because you have to. Not because you're expected to. Not because you need to give me something better than I gave you. How can you give anything better than salvation? You can't. That's his gift. And he says, all I want you to do is be thankful and praise me. I mean, how many times do you thank people for their gift? Oh, that's exactly what I wanted. And then the next day, on the 26th, you're standing in the Walmart at the return line, turning everything back in, getting the cash back. It's like, ain't nobody going to use that blanket. That's ugly. <clears throat> and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with turning gifts, so don't think that, you know, I'm going to be standing there seeing if you're in the Walmart line. That doesn't make any difference. What I'm saying is we say one thing and we do another. Is that how we serve God? Because that's not how God does for us. Everything Jesus Christ says to us, he means and he does. Everything that we say to him, do we mean it? Do we do it? Do we follow it? This is a season of thankfulness and praise. I hope that as we go up on these next few weeks, that that's exactly what we do. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your glorious word this wonderful day, Lord. We thank you, God, for all that you do for us. Lord, we come true you, to you truly with a thankful spirit. Lord, praying that we will always lift your name of every name. Lord, because we know that one day all will bow, that all will hit their knee in front of you, Lord. We know that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that you are the Lord. Lord, we just pray that we will proclaim that through the rest of our lives. Lord, that we will develop an attitude of praise and thanksgiving that the world can see. God, we pray for each person who attends this, who sees this, who is a part of this. Lord, that you will help us, God, to be light in this world of darkness that you will place within us God the fire and the zeal to serve you to go out and to accomplish your will Lord that at this particular time Lord that we can be a light and hope in a, in a dark and hopeless world Lord that through you we can reach others Lord through you they can be changed and through you their salvation will come Lord please use us help us inspire us to do your will in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>